Good morning. Welcome to uh, this Engaged in Personalized Learning conference. I was going to say the first annual, but it, we may do this every month. It's so much fun. This is sponsored by the University, but the University of Florida, but it is intended to serve the interest of the state university system. And before I get started, and by the way, you will notice, because they'll probably fall on the floor, I'm reading from a transcript, in part because Jennifer wanted to make sure I stayed on topic, and in part because she knows if I don't have a transcript, I'll run over the time allotted. So I am looking at what I'm supposed to be saying, but I probably won't say it. Before I get started, uh, I, I, I think it's only appropriate that I introduce and acknowledge the individual who originated this idea and has done most of the work to make this conference happen. Uh, Jennifer Smith, would you stand and take a bow? The topic, Jennifer said to give a welcome, and then she gave me 30 minutes for a welcome, which is a little more than I can do for welcoming. So they, she then assigned me a topic having to do with talking about the State University System's 2025 Strategic Plan for Online Education. This is a topic I should know something about. I have lived with this particular initiative for the last several months, almost daily being cajoled and inspired by the associate vice chancellor of the state university system who is in the audience and I would like Nancy McKee to stand so they know what a cajola looks like. You know, as I was thinking about what we were doing here and the context within which I started thinking about something a little broader and I'm going to take us out to the con to what I call the contextual environment before I zero in on this strategic plan. I would like to think this is the first among several conferences we might have that are dedicated to what I am bold enough to call the science of learning. You see, to me, uh, personalized learning, engaged in personalized learning, really is in the domain of the science of learning. These are pedagogical tools that are used in conjunction with technology as part of that science. And it's important that we look at these separate elements and ultimately important that we bring them together to have the intended impact on learning outcomes. So bear with me for a moment, if you will, before I get to the strategic plan. And let me talk about what I am alluding to here, the so-called science of learning. I want to suggest that what is taking place here is an evolution in our understanding of teaching and learning. And it is important, I believe, that we be on the same wavelength as we go about looking at these tools and later techniques and try to place them in our inventory of things we know and want to know. When I began my academic career more than four decades ago. My view of teaching as a door to learning was an art. Teaching was an art. The emphasis was on the teacher. The emphasis was on the teacher and content. In many, in many ways, the teacher was looked on as a performer. Performance 
was important. Performance brought evaluations from students that were very positive, which was the metric for success. I had a colleague who was clearly a performer. He would wear a gorilla outfit before every exam to clearly intimidate the students, which he probably did. I had another colleague who would wear a little Bo Peep costume after exams, indicating he was looking for the lost sheep that did not, were not successful. And by the by, the gorilla man got terminated. Little Bo Peep still around looking for the sheep. Education was in the main a human practice that was guided by intuition, experience, and occasionally inspiration. But over the years, I believe we have become much more student focused, student learning outcomes focused, more learning focused. We, I think, have finally decided that technology doesn't drive the bus. Teaching doesn't drive the bus. It's learning that drives the bus. And I believe we see an emergence of what might be called a genuine science of learning. Not, I'm not here referring to the neuroscience of learning, that's just developing a feel that it is important and will inform all of us as we go forward. But rather I'm talking about an, ex uh, an experimental cognitive science which has really blossomed in recent years as it has been infused with new technology and new pedagogical te techniques. In fact, there are some who suggest that educators are really empiricist. That teaching is an empirical science, a cognitive science. And whether we understand it that way or believe in that, consciously or unconsciously, that's what we do. As a faculty member, for example, as a faculty member years ago, when I was teaching finance and economics, I decided that the best way to help my students understand valuation was to put them into a case study. And that was my, what I now call my hypothesis, that was my notion. I'd put them into a case study. And as they experienced the case, they would encounter the valuation objects that were important, which we could then model, quantify, and they would have learned. Bad hypothesis. Bad hypothesis. I got the empirical evidence back. And most of them could not untangle the variables that determined the value of an investment opportunity. So I modified my hypothesis. I changed my approach. I decided first I would teach and talk about the variables that affect valuation individually. I would develop some protocol for modeling. And then I would put them into a case. And son of a gun, they did much better. And without knowing it, I was beginning to act as though I were an empiricist. I started with a hypothesis. I got some data. It didn't support my hypothesis. I modified, got some 
that's the process. And that's why I think we are engaged in what I call, that's an example of what I call, the science of learning. So now, you may be asking, and as I was thinking about this, I asked myself, so what the difference does that have to do with the SUS Strategic Plan for Online Learning 2025? And I had to stretch to find that connection, because I was much more interested in the science of learning than the other. But I knew Nancy was going to be here, so I had to pledge allegiance to the other. But it seems to me, as I have lived with this uh, strategic planning process, that as articulated, it really ends up being in an empirical playground. Because what the strategic plan does, and I'll talk about it in a little detail momentarily, it sets up goals, then it sets up hypotheses, they call them tactics, but they're hypotheses. Then they say, okay, how can we go out and articulate, implement those hypotheses? Get some recommendations as to how to do that, and then ultimately there will be an action plan, and we'll get some data, and we'll come back and modify, and eventually we will have developed a strategic plan that is consistent with maximizing the metrics or the goals. So the strategic planning process is, I think, in the final analysis, one more incidence of cognitive, experimental reasoning in which we, as participants in education, are the empiricist. To take you more deeply into the strategic plan, back in late 2012, the Board of Governors of the State University System had authorized a study by a consulting group known as Parthenon. And from that, from that date, all the way up until now, we've been dealing with several facts or factors of variables that are complex. And they become more complex almost daily because this, and pardon my analogy here, this, this river of higher education is being fed periodically by new streams of perspectives or knowledge. And over this last four or five years, at least four new things have popped up or have been re-emphasized. One, that all of you who are involved in education here in Florida know, there's been an in increased demand for higher education. I just saw some data that said for the University of Florida for next fall or next academic year, we've had a record number of applications. We had over 34,000, almost 35,000 applications. And that's not just us. That's happening around the system. So there's an increased demand for higher education. And here's, here's another one. This is no surprise. There's an increased demand for an educated work workforce, properly educated. We hear about that periodically from Tallahassee. That has certainly concerned of both the fund providers and the beneficiaries of the education that we offer. There has been an increased flow of useful and usable technology. I can remember in the first many years when I was teaching, the new technology had to do with the overhead projector and whether you had to carry your own to the classroom or there was one already installed. My God, that was great. But over the last four or five years, things just ha seem to happen overnight. They flow. And then there is the notion that I've already suggested, and that is what we're dealing with is a science of learning 
not an art of teaching. Jennifer's going to tell me when it's time up, and I will ignore her, but she will still tell me. All right, to meet the ultimate goal uh, of increased access in the face of the increasing demand facilitated by technology and new pedagogy, there has been developed this strategic plan. And in some ways, this developing strategic plan is opening the door even wider to the utilization of technology. And technology, by the by, as you know, even though I suggested otherwise, has been around longer than most of us have been around. It certainly informed traditional education. It certainly was worried about quality and access and affordability. This is not new. But what is new is that higher education, at least in Florida, in order to meet its goals of providing sufficient access to those who demand educational opportunity, has decided that the requirements for traditional education, the structural requirements, would be, have been exceeded. And in order to meet the demand, we're going to have to investigate the use of online learning. We tried to meet the demand for access before online learning by setting up a Florida college in every county and a university in every other county. And, uh, and we did all of those things and still we have unsatisfied demand. And so the Board of Governors turned to the possibility of greater utilization of online education. And in this turning to online education, they once again articulated goals, and they were access enhanced, quality maintained, affordability make it affordable. The goals are that combination, the hypotheses or tactics are to maximize on that combination, that trifecta. And then the actions will be viewed empirically to see whether, in fact, it works out. The strategic plan sets out some 50 tactics divided among access, profitability, excuse me, affordability, it was a bad slip. <laughs> Access, affordability, and the uh, quality. Work groups were assigned to each of the tactics, and they were given the mission of recommending how the Board of Governors, the state university system, could take actions to test the hypothesis with the expected positive impact on the trifecta that I mentioned. Now, I'm not going to go through these 50. You can be thankful. But I'm going to talk to you just briefly to give you a flavor of what this is about. Uh, I want to talk to you about those tactics that I was associated with. And I had the opportunity to be associated with nine of them, as did some of the others here in the room who helped make these nine come to recommendations. Let me read you just the first one tactic to give you a sense of how it, how it plays out. This tactic had to do with access and it was to offer a broad range of fully online degree programs in most, in most CIP co SIP codes. Now, what's that about? Well, it's about enhancing access. But so what, 
what programs were we supposed to offer? Well, they, it was the notion. And Mike Ronco, who's hiding back there somewhere, did all of the hard work on this. First, he went out and looked at all of the fully online programs offered across the system, lined them up in zip codes. But then he went out and said, what about, what are the programs, majors, that have been identified as having strategic emphasis for the state, responding to workforce needs? So then he had those that are being offered and those that were needed. And what was required was to, anal to analyze the gap, to discover where there were needs not currently met, ultimately, and how this is been to be done will be left to the wisdom of the Board of Governors. There, there will be a, a notice to the system about we need these programs that are not currently offered because they are of strategic emphasis. That's the process. That was one of the tactics. Let me just run through the others and then I'll quit. Master courses. One of the things that is of great interest in this particular strategic planning because of its potential impact on affordability. A master course used system-wide might reduce the cost of producing courses at your location. Of course, this is an opt-in because we all have the courses already and we're going to have to figure out how to go from having them all in every university to having one or two that everybody uses, master courses. Shared programs, very, very same, very much the same. We all have a curriculum in business. We all have developed a full curriculum in business. The question that was asked, well, do we all need to develop? Can't we share programs? Not a bad idea in the abstract. In the implementation, I'm glad it's not mine. Competency-based education. How do, now we're talking about affordability from the student's point of view. Adaptive learning. All of these are separate tactics that had to be engaged. Open access textbooks. Open educational resources e-textbooks, credit for prior learning, all of those and any one of those could occupy all of us for several days. We're taking just one of them and this conference is engaging it and engaged in personalized learning. We're going to come back together, have to come back together as we talk about all of these. So the work groups reported to the Implementation Committee. Cindy DeLuca of Miss Implementation is out in the audience, hoping I won't call on her. And the Implementation Committee reported to the Steering Committee. And the Steering Committee reports to the Innovation and Online Committee. And they report to the Board of Governors. And the Board of Governors report to God, as far as I know. I don't know who they report to. And eventually, the blessings will be given to the recommendations, and these recommendations will call for us actions, and we will get some data and some output and some empirical evidence, and we'll go back and do the science associated with learning. If you have questions about any of this, please feel free to call on Nancy during the break. She knows all the answers. I know very few. Thank you and welcome.